Okay. Uh, on my right is Asma. She just joined the PhD program a few months. Okay. Uh, can you please raise your hands? Hi. Hi. <laughs> and then next to her is uh, Soleha. Uh -huh. The other side. Yes. Hi. Yeah, she also joined the program a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have Puratulan. Hi. She she is like you. She did her uh, you know uh, proposal almost uh, a year ago, uh -huh. and she's finished in a year time. Hopefully. Okay. Uh, thanks. Just wanted to make sure that at least I knew who you're talking with. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm not sure. Let's. I would like to know uh, what you thought about the the things that I gave you to read, the tutorial and the uh, the, the paper, the chapter, and if you have anything that you want me to to explain specifically or if I just if I should just go ahead and say whatever okay. Hi. Um, I, I mean it's a wonderful experience uh, having a live session with you uh, we have been through the document that you sent earlier and in fact the document is very uh, a good in the sense that it answers so many questions that we are having in regarding Nathan but actually the problem we are having right now is that we are not too sure about how should we proceed while um, doing Mabel modeling. Like, how can we decide that we should structure it this way? What did the, the example Ms. Raghubatu that you um, discussed throughout the chapter, uh, why did you structure it that particular way? I mean, uh, that doesn't seem to follow the object-oriented approach. So what do you have in your mind when you were uh, modeling it Mabel? Or it something different from object-oriented modeling? Uh, what is the key principle that's driving you to model it that way? Uh, okay, e you're talking about the example in the chapter or about another one? Yeah, I'm talking about the chapter. The procurement example that uh -huh. we discussed. So you, you want to know how I came up with that Miben uh, model? Yeah, exactly. Why did you create those particular M tracks? I mean, they don't seem to resemble an object-oriented model or what do you think about it? Okay, I'll explain to you as I as the best way I can. Let's at least. Okay, so oh, I did go through the other uh, approaches we we would have for modeling, right? Um, yes. So the main idea that I that I have, and actually this is kind of the the thing that I'm gonna do on my PhD. That's what I'm gonna write on my proposal is to actually be able to use whatever ontology you have defined. So think as this model as a lightweight ontology. So I have concepts like classes that I have person, public servant, procurement, and I might have attributes like name, and I'm going to have relations that are work for, owner, and so forth. So you can think this as a um, lightweight ontology, okay? Do uh, you follow so far? Can I go ahead? Okay, so um, what I want to do is we might have a huge ontology, but just a few of the relationships or attributes um, we are interested in modeling uncertainty about. So even though we have all these different uh, relationships, attributes, and classes, just a few of those we're going to use to uh, define some uncertainty relationship between attributes and relations. So what I want to do is pretty much uh, get each of these uh, properties or relations. Okay, and You can also think in first order logic as a predicate. We can kind of map to a predicate. And I want to say that that predicate, that property, that relationship is gonna it's gonna be a random variable. So, um, but I'm gonna pretty much keep everything that you define on your uh, ontology, meaning uh, the domain and the range of the properties you define, 
So if you say the range is a, a I don't know, a float, I'm gonna try to to keep that as a float on our uh, Miven or probabilistic ontology model. But since we're talking about the NB base, then we have to discretize it, and uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna create something on my proposal to be able to do that uh, in a straightforward way where you have it's easier to define uh, how you want to discretize the size of your beams and things like that. But for now, you have to do that manually uh, in NB-Base today. But I, would, uh, I try to map every uh, property that I want to be a random variable, that I want to talk about uncertainty, to a, uh, to a random variable or a resident node inside UNB base. So, okay, I have all my ontology, I have the properties. I take a look to the properties I wanna talk about uncertainty. I create them as resident nodes. Uh, but to talk about that uncertainty, I need the relationship between different random variables, right? But uh, that's just, let's say, the mechanical way of doing it. But the way of thinking about the problem, it's what I try to explain on this paper uh, also, so let me just uh, get down here to what I really want to talk about. So this is just a pretty standard uh, way of looking at the problem, and this is kind of a little bit Miben driven, let's say because I say here create a specific situation based on network, but could be any other uh, uncertainty system that you want to work with if you're not working with Miben. Uh, but while you do have to define, even for this kind of problems, you need still to define requirements, you need to do some analysis and design, and you need to implement whatever uh, model or system you're going to use. So you have the modeling part. And uh, I came up with this uh, chapter just to give you a context, because all the time I would have to create a new Miben, I was kind of, oh, where do I start? Where do I go from? Uh, what should I do? And how to approach the problem? So it was really hard for me to every time have to think all over again how I need to create a new uh, uh, model like that. So that's what drove me to, to write this chapter, to at least explain to myself how I do this approach and make it you know, document it in, uh, in a way that I can go back later and see, okay, that's how I should do it. And I mean, we can improve it, but that's the way I think it's easier to uh, come up with the, the systems we want. Uh, and I'm gonna explain uh, why my, I think like that, at least as, a, as I wrote. Uh, so I have the modeling part, right, uh, right here. And I have, the, have to create, later on, I have to populate my knowledge base so you can think as a knowledge base or you can think as a database where you're gonna say, what are my entities involved? So, you know, you have persons, you have procurements, but what procurement are you talking about? What people are involved in this uh, procurements you're talking about? So you have to populate your database. Uh, you have to enter some findings. So if you know something's wrong in some procurement, you have to enter those information also. So it's pretty much your uh, database. Uh, but populated, but associated to the um, to the semantics you have in your ontology and your probabilistic ontology, meaning associated to those concepts we defined uh, earlier. Um, and then we need to do some reasoning because all we really want to do is actually uh, ask the model some questions, right? So I think about this um, kind of model as uh, query driven or objective driven, if, if you may. Uh, so we want to answer questions. So the, for me, the point that you have to start with is asking yourself what kind of questions you want to answer. So uh, on the reasoning part, you would enter those queries and then uh, the system would be able to recover uh, the situation specific knowledge that is associated to that query you want to answer and then come up with the you know, whichever model you're using, in this case is SSBN because it's situation specific Bayesian network for for doing Bayesian network inference for that specific query and knowledge you have associated with it. Uh, Roman, I have, I have a question. Okay. 
Okay, instead of a question. Okay. Okay, instead of starting the modeling in uh, uh, UNB base, can we conceptualize the problem in Protege and then do a mapping which can, you know, uh, map relevant concepts from Protege to me? Yeah, that's what I'm doing on my PhD. The more logical <laughs> to things in that's exactly my work on my PhD. I just finished writing my okay. first chapter and, and that's exactly what I talk about. So I talk about how to do that mapping in a consistent way and, and how to define that on the language. Because today it's, uh, it's one of the problems, one of the things that we could make more compatible between now and Prol is to actually have the mapping between the concepts you already have defined in Al to the concepts, to the random variables you're going to define in, in, in Prowl. So that's exactly uh, one of the main topics I'm going to uh, approach on my PhD. And sometime um, later next year, you know, probably July or so, we're going to have some beta version of that working. So today oh, what you have great. to do is, is my approach today it's pretty much do it by hand, let's say, where you keep the syntax. So uh, if I, when I show you some examples here, I can uh, show you how, how I do that manually. But essentially what we want to do is actually just say, well, you know that concept that I have there as a um, define on my ontology? Well, that's going to be a random variable on this uh, probabilistic uh, you know, modeling. And then I, I'm going to define those, those probability statements to that random variable. But it's going to be associated with the semantic I define it all, and I'm not going to lose that. And today, I, the only way to do that is actually uh, keeping uh, standards as, as far as naming goes. Did I answer your question? Okay, I think we have answered my question. So I call this... Uh, way of looking at the, the problem, this, this model, the uncertainty modeling process for the semantic web. And this is pretty much following the idea of unified uh, process uh, from group and, and, and those other ideas. And here, uh, what I tried to do is actually come up with, okay, so what should I do? How should I approach this modeling? And these things I talked about here. Romel, can you please explain us uh, one example? Uh, example of procurement, uh, how you have drawn it, modeled it. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm just, I'm gonna show now how I think about the problem and how I came up with the the M frags and all that. Okay, I'll I'll try to explain here, and if you uh, you still have some questions, I can. Ask, uh, I can answer specific some questions. But the idea that I have is, okay, remember I talked about on this um, here that I have to talk about requirements, right? So I have to talk, uh, uh, I have to, to define my requirements. And the way that I think it's, for me, worked best to define my requirements for this kind of uh, reasoning system is to actually come up with the goals. What do I want to accomplish? What kind of, uh, uh, what is my goal when I'm trying to define this model? Why am I doing this model at all, right? So you need to have some kind of goals, some objectives. But to be able to uh, achieve that goal, you need to be able to answer some queries, some queries. And uh, that's exactly what I try to break down. So I try to break down in three parts. Well. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to accomplish some kind of goal. For my company, they asked me to come up with uh, some idea of some system to solve some of the problems. But to solve that problem, pretty much uh, what they need is uh, information, questions that the decision makers want to answer, right? So I need to come up with what are the kinds of questions they're going to ask that the system has to answer to be able to come up uh, to achieve this goal. Okay, so that would be what kind of hypothesis I'm trying to, to find on the system that I want my system to find out for me and to be able to answer. So those are my queries. And uh, answering those queries is going to be essential to achieve the goal. And then for uh, every query, if you think uh, uh, about questions you want to answer, and if you think about um, you know, anything in law, if you go to a crime scene 
and people are trying to find evidence to be able to answer questions. So, you know, what happened to this crime? Uh, how did this person die? What time did they die? Uh, who killed it? What, was there somebody else here or was something that, you know, natural cause or whatever? Was it an animal? Was it a person? So you try to collect, to answer those kind of questions, you need to collect evidence, right? So you need to find information on your, whatever domain you're looking at to be able to answer those those kind of uh, questions. But for each type of question you want to answer, you have different evidence you have to collect. Okay? So, uh, you know, if I'm trying to find out if a person, if a... Uh, well, my question is, is this uh, procurement competitive? I mean, uh, is it fair in the sense that all the, the different companies are able to participate in this procurement and it's fair enough, the requirements are not so tough in a way that restricts the, the competition. You know, it's, it asks you just for what is really necessary, but not in a, not too much in a way that, you know, some other companies that could be participating on this procurement, now it's not just because you asked for, a, you know, some requirement that was not really necessary. So I'm trying to answer the question, is this procurement competitive? But to answer those kind of questions, I need to, to look at and say, okay, what does it make, uh, does it make uh, uh, competitive? How do I know that this procurement was, is competitive? Or how do I know that this procurement is not competitive? So I look at things, well, you know, if I only have one uh, company participating on the procurement, oh, that's a sign that it's not competitive. Why do I have just one? You know, I need to have more. I, to have competition, I need to, to, to have at least more than one. So one of the informations I need to know about is, you know, how many enterprises I have participating in the procurement. Another thing that I have to worry about is, well, um, you need to have more than one uh, enterprise participating in the procurement, but they need to be uh, somewhat unrelated. Meaning, if you have... Uh, three different uh, enterprises participating in the procurement. But one, the owner of the enterprise is my dad, the other is me, and the other is my mom. Well, that's not much of a competitive thing, right? Because uh, whoever wins, the whole family wins, so it's just, it doesn't really matter. We can put all the price really high, and the other two is going to put, you know, Two of the, the three companies put the price really, really high, and the third one, that let's say me, just put a not so high, but also a high price. And it doesn't really matter because I'm gonna share my money with my the other two companies, meaning my dad and my mom. So that's the kind of thing you, look, you have to look for. You know, is there a relationship between the owners of different enterprises? So if, there, if they have some relationships, if they are, you know, uh, relatives or if they're really 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 good friends and they're you know go out every day and and you know they have a really uh, strong relationship you might it might not be a problem but you have to at least to look further and do some investigation to make sure that the competition is not that it's not being compromised and another thing is well they know that uh, the enterprise that try to do frauds they know this, that we look for uh, things like, you know, being uh, the, the owner of the company, being a relative for the owner of the other company. So what they do is they actually hire some people or just put some people that know nothing about uh, enterprises to be a front to the enterprise. Meaning, well, uh, in Brazil, we have a lot of, uh, you know, maids and, and gardener and people that work for you and they don't really have a good school and they don't know much about this stuff and they get paid really low uh, salaries but then we go there and say well I give you you know a hundred bucks more just for you to sign these papers I give to you and they're like okay just to sign this paper and say yeah so I just use their name as a front to the enterprise because if I look for, for their information I'm going to see their name, I'm going to see who are their family, and I'm not going to find any association with myself. 
So I can have him as an owner of one enterprise in association with myself. So I can have him as an owner of one enterprise and I can have my maid of honor of another enterprise and I can have some other person of honor of another enterprise and then I can fake competition. Okay, so I have to find this kind of information. So now what I want to answer is, okay, but another way to find out if you have competition or not is to see if the, the people that are owners responsible for the companies, are they really someone that is capable of being responsible for a company or are they just a front for the company? So you see that you keep going with your reasoning and as you try to find out, uh, to answer some of your questions, you have to look further and further about the evidence that you need to be able to come up with that conclusion. Right? Because being able to answer something is all about argumentation. And to have a good argument, you need also uh, to have good evidence supporting your argument. So uh, that's what we try to, to define on the goals. So when I define the, the, the query, you know, when I define the, the requirements for my, for my modeling, I need to know what am I trying to achieve, uh, what are the queries I'm, the system is going to be able to answer, or that I want the system to be able to answer. And to do that, I need to, to say, well, to be able to answer that, what is the kind of evidence that I, the system needs to have or collect to be able to come up with that conclusion or reasoning? So that's how I come up with the overall structure that is going to drive my whole idea of modeling. Well, then I go and say, okay, to answer all this information that I have, uh, oh, okay, so I'll give you some examples besides what I just talked about. Uh, if you go down here, we have things like, um, I want to identify if a given procurement should be inspected or audited. Um, and then I'm gonna, you know, try to find out evidence suggests further analysis needed. So I want to answer a question that says, is there any relationship uh, between the committee and the enterprises that participate in the procurement? So to be able to to answer the, the, you know, to achieve the goal of knowing if I have, uh, if I need to do some inspection or auditing in a specific procurement, I need to be able to answer some questions. And one of the questions is, is there a relationship between the committee of the procurement and the owners of the enterprises that are participating in the procurement? Well, how do I know that? How do I know, how can I know, how can I say that there is a relation. What is the definition of relation between the committee, uh, the people involved in the committee for the procurement, that they're gonna define the requirements, that they're gonna do the evaluation of which uh, proposal is the best, and the people that are responsible for the enterprises. Well, I have to, have, I have to look for members and responsible person of the enterprise that are related somehow, being mother, father, brother, sisters, so if they're relatives, that means they're related. Uh, another thing you can look at is, well, if they live in the same address, even though you don't have the information of if they're, you know, husband and wife or, or parents or a child, you might not have that information. But you might have information about address from other sources or, you know, social security uh, thing or driver, driver license. You might have their address. And then you say, well, if they live in the same place, it's a pretty good chance that they are related somehow. I mean, you might you might argue that it's not a hundred percent sure, but it's a high uh, uh, indicator that well they must be related. Okay. And here on this paper, I'm not uh, I'm not saying that I have the best model for what I'm trying to do. I just try to come up with simple examples to be able to explain what I'm doing. Okay, so. This, for sure, is not going to solve the problem of my country for fraud detection, but it's a good example to show that it can be used and, and how you think about it, okay? So, for this goal, you can have some other questions. So, besides having the relationship between, between the committee and the procurement, you might want to look up for, um, you know, is this person the, the winner of the procurement uh, a fraud? 
So to be able to tell if a person is a front or not to an enterprise, what, what is the kind of evidence that I have to look for? Well, one of the things is you have to, to see the value of the contract for that procurement. So let's say it's a contract for millions of dollars, okay? And then you look for education of the person. And the person doesn't have high school. Okay, he doesn't have high school. But he's owner of a company that just won millions of dollars in a contract. That's, some, that's odd. That's different. And then you look for his annual income. And he makes less than 10 grand a year. So he doesn't have high school. He makes less than, he earns less than $10,000 a year. But he's an owner of a company that makes millions uh, just in one contract. So that's a pretty good evidence that, well, he might be a fraud. Okay? So that's the kind of reasoning that, that I go on and on and on uh, thinking about. So another goal that I want to be able to, in my system, to, to be able to achieve is to identify whether the committee of a given procurement should be changed. So I have I define the committee for the procurement, and then I, I my decision makers want to be able to ask, okay, is this committee good enough, or is there any problem uh, that I should know about, and I better change the committee or take someone out of this committee because they are not suitable for the task. Uh, <clears throat> and the thing comes up, the the questions come up come up is, well, why would I want to change the committee? So I want to make some questions like, is there any member in the committee who does not have a clean history? And by clean history, I mean uh, they didn't have, they didn't go to trial, or even if they were committed, or if they were um, guilty or not, it might not be too good because people are really picky on this stuff. So even though you know the press is gonna say, well, he was not guilty, but he had some dirty involvements, and it was. Uh, he got away with it, but we know it was a bad thing, whatever. So we want to be as clean as possible when we have these committees for the procurements and all that. So, but if the guy was guilty, even worse. And he can be guilty of, you know, really criminal stuff. Talking about, uh, uh, you know, going to law, the, the court as we, as we know it. Uh, doesn't matter if it's civil or whatever. But we also have the, some administrative... Uh, judgments and, and, and investigations because if the person uh, doesn't go to work or if he uses a, f a fake medical uh, license to you know to ask for 15 days of uh, to stay home because he's sick or whatever and we find out that he wasn't really sick and then we do some uh, internal investigation and we then punish him you know take one salary away from him and, and whatever we decide those are not criminal history. Doesn't he does? He's not really judged by any court, whatever. But it is a problem we have. We it means that this person is not as trustworthy as we would like. So we might want to keep this person away from the procurements, from such a important and and uh, task as you know, defining requirements and evaluating uh, uh, proposals for huge procurements. So those are uh, questions you ask, and those are things, evidence you look for to be able to come up with the, the goal of identifying whether or not the committee should be changed. And of course, uh, the, the, the better the work you do here, the better your model is going to be, right? So if you do a poor job here, the system can't make miracles, because what he's doing is pretty much uh, automa doing automatically what you would do in your head. Right, what you would think about, how you would approach the problem. So that's what we're trying to do when we put on the computer whatever people usually do by hand or, or you know, using your heads. So we want to put some expertise, knowledge inside our system. So if the the expert's not really good, our system is not going to be any good, also. Okay. So do you get the idea of how I start to define my problem and how I, I approach it? Yeah. Yep, I didn't hear. This now it's much clearer. Okay. So many uh, of our confusions have been resolved. What's that? Uh, thanks. Many of our confusions have been resolved. Oh, okay. 
You're welcome. That's why we're here. <laughs> I hope so, but if you have any more I hope so, but if you have any more questions, please go ahead. Uh, after identifying the goals and providing the queries and evidences, then we move on to identify the entities, attributes, and relationships. Yes, because uh, remember, uh, we this might is have the path forward. Uh, we might have our lightweight ontology. We might not, but either way, you have to identify in all those properties and relationships and classes that you might have in your domain. What are the important ones? to be able to answer or to model whatever we have defined in our requirements, meaning in our goals and queries and evidence. Okay, so what we want to do is, okay, to be able to talk about these things we just talked about on our evidence and queries and hypotheses and, 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 and goals, what are the attributes, relations and classes that I have to work with? So the entities are pretty much going to be my classes. Uh, the attributes, you know, things like names, uh, name, age, and uh, relationships like work for, winner of the procurement, and so forth. So which ones do I have to look at and do I have to model to be able to answer those questions? So you do that and select the, the uh, one ones. One question. Okay. Uh, you have identified a person entity. Uh-huh as well as an address entity. Uh-huh. Uh, isn't the address supposed to be an attribute of the person? No, because the thing is, uh, you can do it uh, in a thousand different ways, but the address can be really complex because the address can have uh, street names and street names can be, if, if you think about a database, you can have just a table for for addresses. and and. Um, in this table, you're going to have things like zip codes and and some other stuff. So address is not just one thing that can be defined as attribute. Because if you think as a simple attribute, what are you going to map as? Are you going to map as a string? So is, is an address just a string? The address is a, is one thing that has semantics on, it, on its own. So a map is usually inside a city that is inside a country. Uh, has a zip code that has some logic to it. Um, the address, you know, might be associated to a house or, or to an apartment. So you have the address is complex enough to be defined as an entity, as a, uh, a class. But it might be the case for your system that you don't really need something as complex as that. So you just want to model, you know, address as a simple string or whatever. Uh, but we need to be able to talk about addresses. So that's why I create this idea of um, as a class. So uh, remember, you can think as the, you know, a person having an address, uh, this relationship of, you know, associating a person to address is a property of the class person, as you were thinking. But it's just a property that doesn't map to a primitive type like float, dub, or whatever, or string. But it maps to a more complex type, namely uh, <clears throat> uh, address. Is it a little bit clear? No, it's not that. Yes, now we can have a clear picture. Okay. So uh, the other thing that you look at is, well, from the uh, queries and evidence you collected uh, during your requirement analysis, and this also the colors represent which phase we're in. So here we are on the requirements phase, the blue part. The green one, we are on the analysis and design. Okay. And the red one is implementation. As I have defined here, uh, I did it in a way where the requirements and the analysis and design, they are language independent. Uh, they're, you know, probabilistic system independent, let's say. So it doesn't really matter which system you're going to use, if you're going to use Mibin or Prowl or if you're going to use something else. I think 
you should work this way. You should look at your goals, you should look at your queries, you should look at your evidence. Then you should look at the entities you have, the attributes you're going to talk about, the relationships. You should identify rules you're going to have. Uh, they can be deterministic rules or they can be things like fuzzy rules, let's say, where you say, well, if I find this evidence, then it's more probable than that this other thing is going to happen. So you come up with this uh, logic kind of uh, rules inside your head or, you know, you write it down. They can be deterministic, meaning if this happens, this has to happen. Or they can be somewhat fuzzy, meaning, oh, if this is high, it's more likely that this is going to be higher. If this is high, this is more likely this is going to be low or whatever you want to do. But it has this uncertainty idea behind it that later on you can map to real probabilities or you can, you know, eventually use fuzzy logic or whatever system you're trying to use. Uh, and once you do that, and as, well, unified uh, process, they say it's uh, case, uh, use case driven, right? I would say this kind of modeling is uh, goal driven. It's the, the things we define here as the queries or query driven, if you might, if you may. Uh, meaning the queries I'm trying to answer is going to drive my whole uh, modeling uh, approach, right? Because I'm going to ask myself all the time, okay, what's the query I'm trying to answer? To come up with the rules is uh, what kind of query am I trying to answer? You know, what kind of rules works to uh, answer those queries? And then when I want to group all the entities and attributes and relationships that I have defined, uh, I'm going to look at, okay, how are they associated on my rules? So on my rules, I say, well, if this random variable is whatever, then this other random variable is going to be whatever. Or it's more likely it's going to be, you know, high. So if I have a, if this person lives on the same address as this person, then it's more likely that they are related. If they are related, it's more likely that, you know, they're going to have less competition or something like that. So you look at those rules and you look at the queries you're trying to answer uh, to kind of group the um, entities and attributes and relationships together to be able to come up with the M frags later on. But it can be M frags or it can be anything else. You, you can think it as doing modules. So well, this is related to this kind of concept. This other part or module is related to some other concept I'm trying to answer or some other ideas I'm trying to put together. Or you can uh, just think about it as, you know, grouping in an object-oriented way where you look at, you know, things that are related in the sense, well, let's look at identification for people here and whatever I have related to people, address, and things like that. And here, let's look at address and whatever I have related to address and so on. And those are the things that are going to drive your idea of how to separate uh, the whole thing you have, your whole system, into modules. Okay? And then after you do that, and one thing pretty much uh, it's uh, prepares for the next step. So once you have your group these things, you pretty much have a straightforward mapping for uh, Mibin. Right? So you from, from this grouping you do, that it's uh, language independent, you can map directly to uh, even M frags. And you can say that the, those entities that I define here in OWL or whatever I used are can be mapped straightforward to entities in, in Prowl and, and even. And again, some of the thi these things we can do using the tool and some of them we cannot given the, you know, the limitations we have today between uh, the mapping between Prowl and OWL. And again, that's one thing that uh, I'm trying to solve on my, on my PhD uh, research. And then you're going to define the nodes that are your random variables from the properties that in relationships you define here that you know, are going to follow these rules that you uh, define on this other node here. Um, then you're going to have to define your relationships, meaning which nodes are related to which nodes. And to do that, you're going to look at your rules to see, oh, if this uh, random variable is in some state, it's more likely that this other random variable is going to be in the other state. So you can see that this if-then uh, uh, kind of rule 
gives you the relationship between the random variables or at least give you an idea how to come up with that variables or at least give you an idea how to come up with that and after you you come up with the structure of your uh, m theory uh, having the m frags having the nodes mapped uh, have the, having them <clears throat> um, the dependence between different nodes uh, identified then you can say okay now let's look at what should be my probability distribution? Uh, so my local probability distribution, it's gonna, I'm gonna look at those fuzzy, you know, rules that I created here on, on the analysis and design step. And I'm gonna say, okay, I said that if this happens, then it's more likely that this is gonna happen. What does more likely mean? What kind of percentage I'm talking about? So I come up with the local probability distribution uh, rules to identify the distribution for each uh, resident node. And that's the way I usually uh, use to, to create my model. And for that, we created a name for that. And it's probably risk ontology modeling cycle. Uh, I would like to make this language independent also, but for now, uh, I'm pretty happy with just, you know, tying this to, to Miven and Prol and having this being uh, language independent. You have any other, any questions about that? Okay, yes, Romel, I have a question. Uh, you were talking about the grouping thing, that we are actually grouping these anti relationships to uh, The question that I have is, why do we group them in m frags? Why don't we just put them directly in m theory? So, at all, we have a concept of m frags in m theory. Okay. The, the idea is that, well, you know, like, are you used to object-oriented uh, language? Like, have you ever programmed yes. on C++ or Java or something like that? Yes, of course. Uh-huh. So don't you separate by package your system? Don't you create yes. a package for, you know, connections to the database or uh, we whatever. We do, but it the other way, when we, des when we design Bayesian network, we don't group nodes to get That's that because usually the networks are... We may have plenty of nodes. That's because usually the networks are uh, mm. really small or really specific to what you want to do. That's why we have, for instance, Xi uh, Yang, I forgot his name, but he created MSBN. Uh, because what because you want to do is you want to focus. Section. So if yeah, multiply uh, uh, section based on networks. Because what you try to do is actually create sub networks where each sub network is has a domain related idea. So you try to localize things. So uh, what let's say you have a medical uh, model, right? And you have questions and evidence and, and attributes that a person that it, a doctor that is looking at your heart worries about, but the person that is looking at your bones are not going to worry about. So you want to separate that model, although everything is connected somehow, because you're talking about your health and every attribute associated to, to your medical diagnosis. Um, you can separate things to talk about heart problems, you can separate things talking about cancer and uh, lung and you know bones and as we divide things in, in medical science, we can divide our, divide our base on networks in sub networks that can be is used by specific doctors, right? And we have a lot of uh, reasons to do that. One is computation because you don't really need to worry about a hundred nodes because 20 might be enough to answer your question. Uh, you can reuse sub-networks. So if you think about an M-frag, you can actually reuse, create different M-frags, and then you can uh, put them together in different ways because the local probability distribution is going to be exist in just one M-frag. And then you can use this one in other places or in different ways to create a different M-theory. So you can think about it as a Lego, okay, and where you you know you put pieces together in different ways and you create different things, but using the same pieces. So okay, you have a computation size of it within multiple. 
Say it again. Okay, I'm asking that the way we define a relationship within multiple emphases via input nodes. Is that correct? I, I'm sorry, the, the, the sound cut it a little bit, so I couldn't hear. Okay, um, if we have multiple amphrags in the M theory, uh, we can define a relationship between these amphrags via input nodes. So like, the resident node of one amphrag will, may serve as an input node in another amphrag. You would like to define as a, you're asking why do I have input nodes? I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, next question is basically the difference between input node and context node because at times we okay, I can answer that. that what should be a context node or where we should place it as an input node. You, you can think about context nodes there as constraints. So what you're doing is you, in your AMFRAG, you're defining those rules we talked about. Remember when I said, well, if this happens, then this is more likely to happen and so on. But the thing is, to be able to say such things, you need to have a context well-defined. And by context well-defined, what I mean is uh, there are certain uh, constraints that must be satisfied that to guarantee that whatever you're talking about on, on the distributions and relationship between nodes are going to be valid. So those relations are only valid and those distributions are only valid if your constraints are satisfied. So what you're saying is, okay, this node is related to this other node only if the, you know, this is a person and this is an enterprise and this person is the owner of this enterprise, okay? So you, you define constraints because it might not make sense to talk about uh, uh, this relationship if this person is not associated to the, you know, to whatever attribute I'm talking about of this enterprise. Or if they don't have any relation, this, uh, this random variable that I'm defining, this rule, th is not valid. Because the basic constraint that they must be related are not satisfied. But the input node is talking about the relationship uh, pretty much as you do in Bayesian network, saying, well, if I have this node as parent of this one, means that you have some kind of influence and you have a different uh, distribution depending on the state of the parents and so on. But that's not what you want to do with uh, context node. Context node, you're saying, well, this has to be true. Or, you know, this context must be satisfied so I can use uh, the, you know, the sub-network you can think as the input node and resident node. So why do I need the input node? Well, you need the input node because the node you're talking about, the random variable, might not exist on that mfrag. It might exist on another mfrag that you're just using there. So you, you think about, you know, have different, uh, you can think input node as an interface in, in Java languages, where you, you know, for this interface, you can use different implementations. And one of the implementations is an mfrag that has a resident node that you define in your M theory that is, you're using for that input node. So you can think as uh, uh, the input nodes as interfaces that must be implemented, you know, in a way to, to guarantee that your mfrag uh, can be used, but the service that you need, so random variables that must be defined somewhere, doesn't matter where, but must be defined, and your context nodes are just things saying, okay, well, these constraints have to be satisfied, so I can guarantee that this relationship is true. This relationship is valid. Otherwise, I cannot use this relationship because it doesn't make sense. Is it a little bit clear? Uh, thank you very much. It's already very clear. As we have gone through all the uh, papers as well and the chapter, uh, one thing uh, uh, that we wanted to ask uh, is when we generate a situation-specific BN, mm -hmm. then that's a very slow process. Yeah. It takes much time for its generation. Yeah, well, there are a few reasons for it. One, it's, well, it, it is time consuming. And, and one of the problems we have uh, with all these systems that are that have first order logic and they kind of do ground groundings to the first order logics is that, well, as you add more and more entities to your knowledge base, 
the thing gets really, really big. And although the final situation specific Bayesian network, and although the final situation specific Bayesian network might be not that big, uh, we did have to analyze a lot of other, because we create a huge Bayesian network, where pretty much what we do is uh, from every query you ask and from every evidence we have, we build the network from bottom up, meaning from that uh, evidence node, from that finding node, or from that query, up to all the parents until you have no more parents. And we do that for everybody. After we do that, what we do is we cut off everything that is deseparated or it's a barren node. So that's a, you know, even though the final network might be just five nodes, we, we, if you have a lot of evidence, we are gonna do a lot of computing to come up with all this, uh, you know, possible, this huge network that might be the answer for your question. But then we look and say, well, we don't really need all this huge network. So we start cutting off nodes that does not influence the probabilistic uh, uh, value that you have for your random variable, that is your question. But we did have to come up with all the, that network, that huge network. And uh, we, the first algorithm we implemented, uh, the idea was it was just query driven. So from the query, we would go uh, up and down, but we would not go we would not instantiate every single instance and then create this huge Bayesian network and then cut it off. But the thing is, we did have some problems with our algorithms and it didn't work in some cases. So uh, we already know how to fix it. Uh, at least we think we know. We, we did some proofs, uh, uh, some writing downs of, you know, to make sure it, it covered all the possible um, let's say cases and it I think we have a, a an algorithm that's pretty complete now uh, and bulletproof but uh, we decided to first implement Dr. Lasky's algorithm that she has on her paper that has this idea of going from every query and from every evidence node building everything up and then cutting down everything that you don't need because um, this way we have an algorithm that we know for sure that it works and it gives you the right result and then we can create some other uh, algorithms that are more efficient and we can compare and see if we really got the right uh, result. Uh, as these uh, things are really hard to prove and, and to show that it's, you know, works in every single case and, and it's really mind bending. <laughs> it can become really hard to do it. So we decided to just get an algorithm that we know for sure that works and then do that. And we have some other things that uh, we're doing, uh, as we still are in, in beta version, we, we have a lot of uh, debugging going, uh, going out. We create a lot of logs and we have, you know, we spit out some text. And as we do that, the time can take a bit longer because we are really verbose. We, we spit out a lot of things. So when we have some problems, we can go back and see everything the algorithm did step by step. Like right now, I just saw that we have some kind of problem here. I was doing some testing before you, you, you guys showed up and I found out the bug. And it was easy for me to debug because we have all this log uh, spit out on the, the screen, the console, that I could look step by step and say, okay, this is correct. This is right. Oh, here something strange happened because here the network says something and I'm looking at the network on the GUI and it shows something different then it's easier to, to find out what's going on and what's happening. And that also uh, is kind of bad, let's say, for, for performance purpose. So you have a lot of reasons why it's uh, slow. And even the GUI might be one of the problems. Uh, I don't know, it takes, might consume a lot of memory. Um, if you use it as an API, it might be faster. So, um, but those are things that we try to address uh, as often as we can, but now it's kind of uh, hard because our goal is to get uh, these things working and doing the right, uh, implementing the right algorithm. Uh, Roman, the purpose of uh, PR Raoul, uh -huh. is to take ontology mm -hmm. and convert it to an SSPN. Then we revise it, put more evidences into it, 
and then generate a new SSPN. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the direction uh, probabilistic owl. Pro uh, is actually it's trying to define your system. It's, Pro is the idea of Pro is being able to get your ontology and define a certainty, uh, you know, make uncertainty statements about the semantics you have defined in your ontology. So that's the idea of Pro. You want to extend your ontology by being able to say, okay, I have all this domain explained here in my ontology, but a few of those uh, concepts, they are uncertainty. They, they have some uncertainty uh, associated with them. So let's take those concepts and let's define this uncertainty uh, uh, relationship we have in Prowl. But to be able to do that, what Prowl did is, okay, we do have a language, uh, a logic that allows us to do that, to, to get, because you, you can think as how, as a, a you know, first order logic in a different way. They used, uh, ideas from the script, uh, the script language, they used ideas from first order logic to be able to come up with the language out. And what Prowl does is, well, we are also going to use first order logic and we need to talk about uncertainty, so we need to have some system to talk about uncertainty. So what, what kind of logic, what kind of system do I have that does that? And he saw Miben. Oh, Miben does that. So let's just, as I'll use the ideas from, you know, the scripting languages and so, uh, Prowl uses the ideas from Miben to be able to talk about uncertainty associated to predicates, to, to first order logic statements and, and so forth. So the main idea is not creating SSPN, but the main idea is we are talking about uh, pro probabilistic statements related to semantics defined in mythology. But that's just the definition part of it. Well, if you want to reason about it, then you can use Miben logic as you do have a different system to do queries on, on Protege or using AL. You have different uh, implementations of how to do queries, right? How to make questions and come up with uh, answers. You, all, you can also have different uh, ways to have a Prowl probabilistic ontology defined and come up with different answers to it that can be what we use today using NDBAs and uh, SSBN generation, but you can have something else. But it's more intuitive to think about SSBN generation because Prowl uses Miben to define that. And the way to do reasoning in Miben is creating uh, SSBN by uh, doing your query and having your findings. So what I'm trying to say is the goal is not create, to create SSBN, it's to define uncertainty. And to define a certain, he used a logic language that puts together first order logic and uh, Bayesian networks to talk about uncertainty. And he just defines that. But to do reasoning, you can have other tools and other systems or other APIs that usually, as you're talking about Nibin, you're going to do some uh, SSBN construction. Is it clear? Is the API available? Well, the, the only one impl implemented Base. so far is uh, UND Base, at least available uh, for other people to use. I know some other people, uh, I know one person from uh, Poland, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, implemented uh, an API and he didn't uh, worry about too much about um, GUI, so just did the API. But it's using he's using just for himself and his project, and he didn't make it available or he didn't publish anything to talk about it. So what I can say is the only thing available so far that I know of is Wendy Base, and you can use its API. You just use the the Java code we have, and you can use it to create whatever you're doing, and you don't need to use the GUI as we have it here. I think it's easier to create the the model, but if you want to just do reasoning after you define your model, you can just use our API, and that's pretty straightforward, and you should be able to do that. But as far as having other implementations, I'm not really sure where you would find it.
by the way um, does it use a smile engine behind the scene for inferencing no we use uh, we use um, power loom for the first order logic part and we have our own algorithms and implementation for the you know MIB and SSBN construction part so we, we have some algorithms that we implemented ourselves and we didn't use anything but to to come up with the like when we do pretty much is the the context notes when we evaluate those notes meaning remember i talked about the constraints have to be satisfied to be able to create them frag to use them frag so what we do is those questions uh, are the con you know the context nodes satisfied we ask those questions to uh, power loom so it's a first order logic uh, API that is available, and we make those questions to to power loom. Yeah. And once we know that those nodes are, you know, those constraints are satisfied, then we keep up. We continue the SSBN construction using our own algorithms. Our own, I mean, our implementation of Dr. Lasky's algorithm. Well, I think it was not very clear to me. I probably get, didn't get it. It UNB based API or are you working on its uh, alpha version? Uh, is UNB based what? API. I mean, if you want to directly access UNB based API in our through our code, uh -huh. can we do it now or or is your group working on it? No, no the thing is, uh, we haven't. Uh, we haven't created a release for just the, the the jar file, let's say, as a library, but you can you can do it in a, a lot of different ways. You can, you know, just I have a fact on our website that tells you how to download the project to Eclipse, and from Eclipse you can you know use the code from Eclipse as making a reference to to the Unity based project, or you can from Eclipse create a jar file and and use it. What I mean is the code is there. One, once you download the release, it comes with the binary and source code also. So you can use that. We do have the jar file that has the whole thing, but also the GUI. Uh, so it has the API not only for the algorithms, but also for the GUI. And that comes with the release also. And you can use that as your API. Just the jar file as any other you know, Java library. Uh, but then that library, it's oh, not okay, just. Now it's clear. What, what happened that when you, we were we were looking at the help file of UNB base, it's I think it's still in which is what? It's a still Brazilian language. It's not in English yet. No, we have a well. We have a help lot of file. stuff. All the well, this, we started this project in two thousand. UNB base. So when we started, we had a lot of stuff uh, developed in Portuguese. Then uh, after, I don't know, I want to say 2004 maybe, we, we started implementing everything in English. And uh, everything we came across from the, that we had developed in Portuguese, we would translate to English as we would go by. But we never had the resources to stop everything and just translate every single sentence we have inside the base to, to English. So what we try to translate the most is the method names, the classes names, and you know every documentation we have from that point on, you know from 2004 maybe uh, to nowadays. So if you look at things like OBN and if you look at Mibin, uh, those should be in English. You might have some of the descriptions, some of the some comments inside the code in Portuguese because uh, not everybody everybody is really familiar uh, with English. So we have some stuff that are really really complex to explain, and they felt more comfortable. No, just uh, Roman, what you know? We figured out that Portuguese is not a very difficult language. What's that? I mean, it follows the same script, though. We were able to decipher some of your, you know, comments. <laughs> I can hear well. Now, what I am saying is that the Portuguese language, I mean, it seems that it's not very difficult. At least, you know, we will understand some of the co uh, some of the comments. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> but, 
you, you know, uh, the thing is, what I want to say is, a lot of the new stuff, they should be in English. If they have in Portuguese, it's because it's something really complex that they felt more comfortable living in Portuguese. And as I go by the code and I find this Portuguese sentence and I have to do some refactor or whatever, or do some debugging, I usually translate as I go by. But you should have enough material to be able to understand what you're doing. And as far as tutorial goes, uh, we're trying to create those, um, you know, uh, this year we did some tutorial as you saw. And what I do usually, we do have three examples. We have an example folder where we show uh, briefly how to use the API for uh, Bayesian Networks and MSBN and the GUI, I guess, for, for Bayesian Networks also. This is inside UNBBase, it's a package example. Uh, it, it's a, the package example, UNBBase.example. You have some really simple uh, examples to, to show how to compile the network, how to get the probability statements from the probability values from the random variables and so far. But if you have any specific questions on some of this stuff, usually I'm, uh, I answer by email. So I would direct you to some you know, tutorial, I would give you some examples or whatever, but I would usually, I answer emails by request. But it is hard, it isn't hard for us to understand the MIBAN implementation that we did ourselves. <laughs> we can imagine how hard it is for others to look at the code and understand everything. <laughs> No, but, but I think now you have quite uh, you know, enough documentation in the form of chapter and also the way it's very helpful on the wiki. Uh, it's quite helpful. And we also try to follow that, you know, Miven thing. Uh, what, what, what was the title of the paper? Uh, with a thing. Multi entity with, with, with a multi entity. Yeah, the thing which Paulo and Dr. Lasky wrote back uh -huh. in 2007. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it was also very helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think it gives you a good start to play around with this stuff. And usually as you go around and you create your own model, you have specific questions that usually where you can send emails and we can answer and so forth. But I mean, this chapter, right. I like to talk about it because it gives you an idea of how to think about Miben models and how you think about Prowl models and how to start from scratch to create something. And that's why I, I, I wrote this, this Chapter. So usually when I give no, the base tutorial, I talk about this it's stuff. It's really cool and explains the full concept from start to end. Um, so this, this is a wonderful stuff. Do you do you have one other thing that I uh, want to ask is do you have any specific questions about using the tool? Something you want to make sure you understood or why it's a certain way or anything like that? Do you want me to show anything working or, you know, I know you tried a little bit, uh, you used a few times. Is there anything you had trouble with? Um, we have designed um, some Mabel model on a particular case study. In fact, part of your examples in UNB based Lahore bombing case study. Uh -huh. So we, we attempted to design our own Mabel model uh, for that case study. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, it can be a good idea to send that model over to you guys so that you can that sounds good. give it. That would be really, really good because we're uh, also working on that model. And that model is really, uh, we had some problems with it because as I told you, the as you put more instance and you put more victims and you put more people, you know, terrorists or whatever you want to call it, agents on the, on the yes. as findings, uh, as instance of your entities, okay. the model gets really, really big. So we had a memory overflow a lot of times. And you can think about if you wanted to create that model just using Bayesian networks, having all those engines, you would come up with memory overflow. And it's not a MIBAN problem, but it's a Bayesian network problem because the table just becomes huge. You have like 10 parents and each parent has, you know, three states. And then you have uh, the child with I don't know how many states, and you do the multiplication there, you can see that table is huge, and there is no way the system can handle it. Uh, any system at all, if you talk about uh, Netica or Higin, uh, you're gonna come up with the same kind of, up with the same kind of problem. 
So one of the things that uh, we're working here at George Mason is uh, doing hypothesis management and to come up with approximate solutions or to worry about just instances that are really uh, you know, strong enough on the query we're asking and not worry about those information that are not so relevant. So we cut off some stuff that are not de-separated, but they don't make that much difference. So those are a few things we are working on to make the performance better and to make it even feasible. So uh, just to, to let you know that uh, even the Lahore is already a complex enough uh, example that might run in some problems when you try to uh, do the SSBN uh, generation construction. Yes, time and again we have had uh, the problem when executing queries in Maven in UNB base. So we don't have the reason the Lahore bombing uh, example that we developed in UNB base. Mm -hmm. So the model is uh, complete. We have given signed knowledge base is ready, but I am not yet able to generate SSBN over that model. Yeah. Um, maybe there is some problem with the model itself, or because UNB base is giving me some app, even it's not letting me save that file. So maybe there is some problem with the model itself. Uh huh. Uh, anyways. Well, there are a few things I that I that I know of, you. and I one I just discovered today that might be the problem that we we are having on uh, at least we were having in uh, the Lahore example is one of the, of the the problems you see is inconsistent or under underflow. I don't know if you got that message. Have you ever got that exception? It gives you an error and says uh, inconsistency yeah, or underflow, something like that. And that inconsistency or underflow is usually when you have a probability, probability distributions. You have a table that says, well, if this node, if the parent one is in state one and parent two is in state two, then the, the node, the child node for sure has probability zero. But then in your system, you have something saying that the, the child node has, has the state zero instead of having state zero as 100%, has state one as 100%, that should be zero, given the, the findings that you have for the parents. But that, I think, is a problem with the NV base when it's setting the evidence, because the network seems to be constructing everything correct, but I think when it's actually setting the evidence, saying that, well, this state is 100%, I think we are setting the wrong states in some cases. Because one example that I just tested today, uh, I got that problem as I was debugging. So one of the reasons why we are getting that message uh, so often uh, might be that we're setting the wrong uh, states to, to 100% instead of the ones that the, the user told us to set. So that might be one of the problems that we are having uh, so often. And the other one might be just memory, you know, memory explosion there for okay, too much stuff. That is that I got is event not unique. Okay, that one Error is manipulating your... <laughs> PR file. That one I have to check <laughs> out. That one I haven't had yet. <laughs> if you could send me a screenshot in the model and the query you asked. Uh, that'll be great. I will. I mean, you need to send me the model. Oh, in fact, you know, Roman, uh, the, the a model as uh, you built in you know, a for Lahore example. Actually, what we did, uh, basically, the, what, what what they did, they took your narration and tried to come up with their with uh, with their own Miven model. So, at your solution. Say it again. So, it's not the same model as yours model. It's not the same, right? Yeah, it's not the same. Uh, it, it's 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 the same for Lahore. I mean, uh, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that we we use the same narration for Lahore uh, bombing. Okay, but you 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 same made some modification, right? Even. So maybe that's why they, they are you know creating some new errors. No. Okay. I have to check uh, to see what's the source of the error though. Because I have no idea. Yeah, probably. So we will send you the actual model too. Besides okay. the screenshot, we'll send you the actual model. Okay. And uh, besides sending the model, you should send the the instance and the findings also. The PLM model. The PLM is a power loom model. I'll send you the model and knowledge base file. Okay. Right. 
right? Yeah, the, the knowledge base, the, the, the model itself, and the, the query you're asking. Okay. Uh, what is the difference between uh, UNB-based support for multiple section BN as well as OOPM? Yeah. Are you using OBN to convert to MIBN or? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, I, uh, I had this uh, separated here to talk a little bit about if you wanted me to. <clears throat> but one thing that I can tell you about right now is what I'm doing. Uh, remember, we talked about creating the MFRAGs and having some uh, saves on computation and be able to plug and play with different MFRAGs and so forth. Uh, we want to explore uh, local. Uh, relationships not worry about other things so what we're doing now uh, and I'm actually debugging it's not ready yet it's instead of creating the whole Bayesian network for the the query you ask we actually create a MSBN from the query so it's a situation specific MSBN instead of a situation specific Bayesian network so the user is gonna see not the whole thing together but he's gonna see the different sub networks to get as a MSBN, and then he can work on those specific sub networks and not worry about the whole thing. And it's easier to see, it's faster, you know, not to build, but it's faster to uh, propagate evidence and, you know, easier to look at it and so forth. So it has all the advantages that MSBN has over basic networks. So we uh, put that inside uh, MIBAN uh, reasoning also. But I'm still debugging, I'm still finishing that, that implementation. Okay, so let me go back to OBM. <coughs> um, so as you can see here, uh, this example that I opened, the uh, OBM and Star Trek, the ST4T3. <clears throat> what do you, you can think about this model here as modeling uh, the query that we would make in our MIBEN uh, theory, asking uh, what's the harm potential of the Starship 4 on the time step 3. Okay? And uh, I can tell you straightforward that for me, what it uh, feels like is that you do by hand what MIBEN would do for you automatically. Okay, so you kind of have the same nodes here, you have high current potential, and the table distribution is going to be pretty much what you're going to have uh, once you compile our, our local probability distribution to a CPT table in UNB base, <clears throat> but you would have to do it by hand instead of using that grammar we have for uh, local probability distributions. Um, and we have you have some some other nodes that are <clears throat> these guys are input node. I think it's input nodes, and I don't know if it's input. Hmm. Let me see if I change. Yeah, it's input node. <clears throat> so this, the idea here are the input nodes the same thing as in even. So you have this node that the distribution defines somewhere else. And if you look at this here, it's uh, distance from all, from on, and this node is gonna be defined somewhere here. So this node, distance from on, depends on a previous distance from all. So you know this guy depends on a previous guy, and this is gonna be output, and this is gonna be input. <clears throat> and this guy here is pretty much what I told you you would do by hand. So these guys you can think as uh, fragments as you would in, in MIBIN, okay? So you have the, you know, some of the, the, the difference is some of the nodes are considered output nodes, meaning they're gonna be used in other fragments, in other sub-networks. Some of the nodes that in MIBIN would be, all would be resident in uh, OOBN you divide, some are output and some are private nodes, meaning you don't really care, the nodes are just, uh, they're just used inside that, uh, they're just used inside that uh, 
that network, that sub network, whatever you, that section, whatever you want to call it, and they don't really, they are not really used anywhere else. So you have the input nodes, meaning things like in Liban, things that you need as interfaces that must be defined somewhere else. You have the output nodes, meaning things that are going to be used as input nodes somewhere else, that in Liban would be uh, the resident nodes. And you have the things in between, meaning there are resident nodes to this network, but they are not really used anywhere else. Okay? But then, you would have to create your network by hand, what you would do just by making a query in, in Niven. So the thing here we're trying to ask is, uh, sorry, uh, we made some changes, a friend of mine made some changes, is making some changes uh, on the GUI, and I can't resize here so you can't really see the name of the nodes, but uh, I'm gonna compile and then it's gonna be easier to see what I have here. But pretty much what I have is, can you see that those are different copies of the same, um, the same, let's say, mfrag, on this case here, the same class, whatever it's called, I think it's class, each of these here are classes. So in each class, uh, uh, you're making different instantiations of the same class. So here all of these are a distance from uh, distance time slice. So distance time slice you have some distance from on depending on the previous time step this is from on previous. And here you just have different instances of the same kind of thing. But as different instances they have different names, they represent different things. So here it's you can think as time to, uh, time step 0. So the time step zero uh, is going to be the input uh, node for time step two, and time step two is going to be input for time step three, and time step three is going to be the parent of the node that we would have that depends on that distance from on. From on. Uh, and then you have the private nodes that you don't really see here, but you also see that this other node depends uh, comes these input nodes comes from the other uh, class where it's defined as output node and this other one here is the number of enemy ships and the number of friendships uh, they are defined as uh, outputs nodes in another class so they're used here and here are the outputs and one of these outputs are what we are trying to find out it's the harm potential of the starship ST4 you can think of and then when you compile, uh, you can see here that the network you get is pretty much the same thing you would get in UND base, uh, in Mibin, using Mibin, I mean, but it would do for you automatically. You would not have to worry about it. Uh, so you, what you have here, so what you have here is, well, I'm doing this query, and to answer this query, I have all this information, these other nodes, and <clears throat> it depends on this node that it has some uh, recursive uh, dependence on the previous uh, time steps. So if you lo look at the other networks, you're gonna see that this distance, you know, the distance 15 depends on the 18, the 18 depends on 21. The names here are really bad because it seems like the larger number is actually the previous time. So <laughs> it's not really intuitive, but <laughs> just bear with me. <laughs> so you can see you can see that the times distance 15 depends on the 18. The 18 depends on 21. Okay? And then the 21 doesn't really have a previous because it's the last one. But it just have a, a prior with uniform distribution here and has another distribution there, okay? And you have, but if you put everything together, pretty much what you get is the same as SBN you would get in MIBIT. Of course, if model the same way. And also the zone would have its own fragment here. So these guys, they're used in another, in the other end frag down here. Um, so, if you go back, you look at this here, if you go back to here, you can see that this, 
the the creation of that uh, MSBN is uh, it depends on how you did manually the map from the output to the input, from the output to input, and so forth. But this is actually done automatically in Eben, and here on LBN you would have to do it by hand. And of and of course, here you don't have to worry about the constraints, the context nodes, because you're doing by hand, so you're you know you're mapping things by yourself. You don't need to guarantee any constraints because you're doing you know what you're doing. And you don't have to say anything. Uh, you just you know do it yourself. But for to work automatically, you do not you you do have to have constraints on on Niben to be able to to follow some rules to create the the thing automatically. And if you look at Niben, what you have is pretty much the same thing. The example in setup OVN in Niben. If you go to harm potential, the starship and frag. You can see here what we did by hand on these two nodes. It's actually defined just as, you know, this. The current time step depends on the previous one, and I don't have to make copies of it. it the copies are, are created automatically by the tool when it does the SSBM construction. Um, the same thing goes for these two nodes. I don't have to do the mapping. The mapping is done automatically. Once I have this node here, I define that, you know, the resident uh, node is defined on another M frag, and this is how I do that, you know, arrow thing from the output to the input. But I don't have to do it instance by instance. I do it as a whole, meaning from the class, the property from that class to the property of the other class and so on. And then the instances are, are automatically mapped to those uh, things. And, um, but the result we would get was pretty much the same. I'm not going to compile here because it's going to give me that error that I talked about, but I did get the, the, the resulting network that it got from compiling this network and I put it here and you can see that the but I just created two time steps T1 and T0 but you can see that the the overall structure of the networks is the same it has some differences because of the way we model we don't have the etexis on the other uh, system we talked on the other OBN model we showed later uh, previously and if I compile you're gonna see here that has some some values. Oh, I didn't save the network again. I don't have to change this. But see, the problem here is saying that uh, the it exists is false when it should be true. So we're setting the wrong values to the nodes. That's why we're getting some errors. This should be 100% here, 100% here, and should be 100% here. Meaning the Starship ST0 exists. Um, the Starship ST4 exists, it's true. I have one enemy ship, I have one friend ship. And then how does that influence my chance of having harm potential from Starship 4 to in time step T1? And it depends on the range and so forth that I have here. So due to some bugs on setting the right evidence on the final network, uh, we're not having the correct SSBM generated. But in some other cases, we do have it correctly. So it's kind of weird. I have to debug that. So if I open the example that I showed you, that I talk about on the paper, even uh, procurement and fraud, and I load the knowledge base here, and I do some query, meaning do I have to change my committee for the procurement too and execute? going to take a little bit, venture is going to come up. Uh, but then you, you get the right, the right value set up here. You know, this person, member three and, and person, th person three, they live in the same address. Uh, so the chance of they being related is now 90%. And that with the clean history of me, a lot of, you have some members that have clean history, 99%, and, but one guy was convinced to have 
clean history, 99%. And, but one guy was convicted of administrative uh, investigation. And then has screen history becomes uh, false with 99%. So we would like to change this committee, you know, the probability that we should change this, for the, this committee is 88%. So here it works fine and the evidence are set correctly. So I just have to figure out what's going on with the Starship example that it's not working. But anyway, that's the, the process, that's how it's done. Um, that's how the construction works. It goes from the query and from the input nodes all the way to the parents until it doesn't have any more parents. And then after that, we remove the nodes that are deseparated from the query, given the evidence, and we remove the parent nodes. And we come up with this final uh, SSBM that it's smaller than the whole thing. And I guess that's it. Is there another question? And just again, OOBN and Nibin, you can pretty much do the same thing on both, but uh, what I would say is that Mibin is more powerful. It's more expressive. It has more expressiveness inside its language that allows you to define things in a more high level way. And you don't have to worry about doing mappings uh, by hand and it would construct the SSBN by, by itself. Where in OOBN, you would do that SSBN construction yourself doing mapping one thing by, you know, one by one. Any other questions? Um, um, last uh, question, Miguel. Is uh, the inheritance part or the subtypes, for example, the types of starships, Cardassian? Today. They are defined in the uh, probability distribution table. Mm -hmm. So that's under construction as well? Uh, it should be. But in our current implementation of UNB base, we don't have it because we don't have subtype. So we just assume we just we don't have a hierarchy, we don't have subtypes, and I know it's simple, yeah. but it's be, it's been able to answer a lot of our to model a lot of our problems. Uh, but that's a future work okay. we're gonna do. But you know the language itself it allows you to do it. Uh, Prow allows you to do it, but UNB base doesn't allow you to do it. So you would inherit everything, including the you know, the relationships and whatever definitions we have, the, the no. probability distributions and so on. No, in a case of Prowl, uh -huh. from ontology, there is an is a hierarchy that has to be supported, no? Okay. The ISA is pretty much saying it's types. I don't yeah. know if Prowl does Prowl. It's type of. Yeah. But... I'm not sure the prowls makes you use it. Because if you look at the Starship example that they gave on the multi-tiers, uh, without multi-tiers, um, it is defined as a mfrag by itself. So it's something the user has to do because I, I think prowl is not, it's not typed. I might be wrong, but I don't think it's typed. It, you you define the type uh, uh, how to use types and and, and to have the types uh, m theory by having another m frag that is defined in the starship um, example you can see on the paper. But what we did is we put that as a as something uh, internal to NB base when we created this implementation. So we don't want the user to be to create an m frag just to talk about types. Our implementation is already typed. So that's why you need to, to use this ESA node. It's something built in, something given. You don't have to, to define yourself. For example, in the procurement uh, domain concept, uh, you have written in this chapter that uh, a public servant is a type of person, but currently is not supporting. So we are taking a Person yeah, I might have people. misspoken it. Uh, uh, um, it's not that Prowl doesn't have it, it's that UNB base doesn't allow it. So uh, that's something that I should fix. Okay, uh, one more thing that we usually found missing in UNB base is that it doesn't give any graphical representation of the whole 
Of the what? Like you can give uh, the of graphs the... of individual M frags. Yeah, yeah, we can. We, that's something also on our to do list. But our to do list, the priority also always goes to. We have started to... our wish list now. <laughs> <laughs> It always goes to the to the algorithm implementation. The 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 GUI stuff is I don't know how we managed to actually come up with the GUI for this new GUI for MD Base. I don't know if you use the older version of MD Base, but if you did, you saw that we had a really big improvement in GUI. Uh, it's a lot closer to what people use on Hugin and Netica now and, and Genie than it was before. Uh, you know, having those belief bars uh, view and so forth, being able to resize nodes, feed to text, and so so on. So, um, um, I mean, we do our best, but again, it's an open source project, and we don't really get money to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's something I when I write papers, I, I every time I write a paper, I say oh, I wanted to have that overview so bad, <laughs> so I don't have to go to you know Firefox and <laughs> Keep editing and copy and paste. At least you can save each uh, M frag as uh, image, or not. I don't know if we we extended that to to Nippon or not. Now I'm not sure. But for Bayesian networks, I know we can save the Bayesian network as a uh, image, and then we use this image and put everything together. But for Nippon now, I'm not sure if I have it or not. Let me check it real quick. Yeah, I guess I I guess we don't have it. You you have to do a screen. Uh, screen capture and copy and paste in Fireworks, whatever, uh, you know, Photoshop, whatever you use, and put stuff together to see the overall. Yeah, that's something we would like also. If you want to do that, we'd be happy to um, put it here. <laughs> and there is an optional learning in tools menu, and it accepts a so, it accepts uh, does what? it have anything to do with Maven or is no, it? No, no, learning is just for Bayesian network. network. Simple just Bayesian networks. We have learning just for Bayesian networks. Okay. Uh, we haven't done anything for Maven yet. Uh, so, would it be structure learning or parameter learning both. for Bayesian networks? We have both. We have a few different algorithms both. implemented, but we have structure and parameter learning. Okay. Okay. Okay, Roman, I think uh, we are out of the question, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank Have you. Have a great day. Uh, thank you very much, and Merry Christmas. Yeah? Merry Christmas to you too. Bye-bye.